So today we're going to be speaking with Dr. Rian Eisler, who is a social system scientist, cultural historian, attorney, and activist, whose research, writing, and speaking has transformed the lives of people worldwide. She is the pre president of the Center for Partnership Studies, which is soon to be the Center for Partnership Systems. Her book on economics, The Real Wealth of Nations, Creating a Caring Economics, was hailed by Archbishop Desmond Tutu as a template for the better world we have so urgently been seeking. Dr. Eisler also pioneered the expansion of human rights theory and action to include the majority of humanity, women and children. Her research provides a new perspective on our past, present, and possibilities for our future, including a new social political agenda for building a more humane and environmentally sustainable world. And so for me, after years of hearing about Rian's work, I got to see her keynote at a conference at Bretton Woods, where everything she said just lit me up. And by the end of her talk, I was on my feet, giving her a standing ovation with every single participant there. She spoke truth at a time when we were hungry for answers, and I had a feeling my life would never be the same. And since that moment, for almost two years, I've had the pleasure of being mentored and working alongside her at the Center for Partnership Systems, where her vision on how we build an equitable future inspires me to action daily. And today, we'll be focusing on an in-depth conversation about her bestseller, The Chalice and the Blade, Our History and Our Future, that was first released in 1987 and is now in 27 foreign editions and 57 U.S. printings. I read this book cover to cover and it shifted my consciousness in the way that no other book had done before. Her words and research made visible everything I knew in my heart to be true about a world where the feminine, goddesses, and the planet were once revered. And it is my honor to have a conversation with her today. And I hope all that are watching will be as illuminated as I have been and people all over the world. So Rian, we lost you on camera. Are you still there? I am still here. I wonder why you lost me because I can see myself. You can see yourself? Do you want to just start your camera over again and we can start again? Uh, well, let me... Uh, now I don't see myself. Now I see myself. Am I back? You're not back on my side. Huh. But maybe well, it'll just... It'll just click into place. This happened yesterday for some speakers, and I'm sure. That well, we'll I tell you, I, I clicked on the link that Anu sent me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm here, so I'm You're afraid. Here. I'm afraid to leave because goodness knows what will happen. No, you don't have to leave. I think I think we're good. I think if you clicked on the video link and clicked it on and off again, we might be back in business. But if not, we can just continue to have this conversation. Well, I did click on the video twice now. Okay. And, uh, well, let's, and nothing hopefully you just come back on. Okay, well, all right. Uh, I um, am sorry about the technical difficulties. I think um, all of us are very used to it by now that we live in. I see that virtual. the organizer is saying, leave on the video, it will resume. So we'll have some faith. <laughs> Great. So um, why don't we just dive in? Um, yeah. I know that your work for The Chalice and the Blade spanned 10 years of research, but that it really stemmed, or the original question stemmed from your childhood experiences in Austria that formed your worldview early on in life. So would you, can you tell us about that? Well, as you can see, we are doing a sort of a chat keynote instead of a, just me uh, being a talking head, an invisible one, I gather. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I did, when I uh, keynoted, uh, the opening keynote that I gave yesterday, go into quite a bit of detail on that. But to make a long story short, uh, the passion I have for this work really is deeply rooted in my childhood experiences as a child refugee with my parents from the Nazis. And uh, what... Uh, happened was that, uh, well, I, 
experience cruelty and uh, insensitivity, and uh, yes, I also saw violence against my father, but by a miracle, my mother got my father back from the Nazis on Crystal Night, um, and uh, we were also by a miracle able to escape. Uh, I should add only because my parents had the means, uh, first of all, to get my father back, money did pass hands, and secondly, to buy an entry permit into to Cuba, uh, one of only two places really where you could get uh, to uh, if you were a Jewish refugee from Nazi Europe at that time. And I grew up in the industrial slums of Havana where until my parents got back on their feet, I experienced poverty, real poverty. And I also saw poverty around me. Uh, these enormous gaps between haves and have-nots at that time in Cuba. And so that led me to questions like, does it have to be this way? And because, um, you know, we're told that's just human nature, that's how it is. And if there is an alternative, what is it? And of course, it wasn't until many years later <laughs> that I set out to try to answer that question through my multidisciplinary, cross-cultural, historical research. And I came up with a resounding yes, there is an alternative, but to even see it, we have to, well, we have to do what Einstein said. He said, you cannot solve problems with the same thinking that created them. So yes, that's what my work now is has been about is fresh thinking. And, and I know, I know that this is, do you hear an echo on your side? Okay, okay. I think that if you mute yourself when I'm speaking, the echo will go away, but I see you again. So we're back in business. <laughs> Great. So um, you have told me that there was an awakening that happened to you in your 30s that inspired you to write The Chalice and the Blade and do all the research that you did. Can you tell me more about this? I sometimes think of my life as the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle coming together. Um, and uh, Mary Hendrickson just wrote that, yes, that the, my escape to Cuba is ironic in that the ship St. Louis also headed to the US and Cuba was Jews and was turned away. And we were actually on one of the last ships before the St. Louis. So we really did escape just by a hair's breadth. But uh, to fast forward um, to this sort of awakening that I experienced, um, I woke up from what I today call the domination trance. Um, in the late 60s, along with thousands of other women in the United States, some in Europe and elsewhere, to realize that so many of the problems that I had solved were just me, you know, something's wrong with me, I weren't personal. I shared them with all these other women. <laughs> they were social problems. And so I threw myself into the, and it was really an awakening. I mean, I, you know, I, I write about changes in consciousness. And I know from my own experience that we can change our consciousness and we must change our consciousness, by the way. But I mean, just to give you one example, when I graduated from law school, I went to the UCLA School of Law. I wanted to be an entertainment lawyer and I got a job um, part-time because I have children. Uh, as an entertainment lawyer with the Beverly Hills Entertainment Firm. And one day, uh, the big boss in the firm called me in to commend me because I had handled the case well. And he said, you don't think like a woman. And you know what? Not only he, but I took it as a compliment. So don't tell me that we can't change our consciousness, that we can't now see, my God, that was an insult. I mean, I am a woman, <laughs> um, but um, but that really, um, and when the Equal Rights Amendment, I wrote the only mass paperback, I mean, I did a lot, um, 
I founded the first center in the United States on women and the law, wrote a brief to the Supreme Court of the U.S. Um, we changed a lot of things, but not enough. And when it came to passing, the simple amendment, the Equal Rights Amendment, and I wrote the only mass paperback out of my legal experiences on that called the Equal Rights Handbook, which is unfortunately still completely relevant. When it was defeated, I realized that, yes, it's very important that we change laws, but it's not enough. We have to change the culture. And then, of course, I had to ask, change it from what to what? And that opened a whole vista. I'm, I'm very fascinated by how art history came into that. And I know that there were a few clues and ahas as you did your 10 years of research with the Chalice and the Blade. What were some of those? Oh my gosh, there were so many of them and uh, so many aha moments. Well, at first, um, I mean, you know, I <laughs> when a Chalice came out, um, this, I mean, there was a tremendous response to it internationally. Mm -hmm. um, and that was in 87. And of course, it's, it's an evergreen, as you said, it's uh, in 57 US printings at this time. And um, also um, in many foreign editions, it's causing a major media firestorm in Spain right now. I mean, I have an interview almost every day with the major newspapers there. But, and we have to do that here in the United States because that's how people change their thinking. But as, I, I, it, like I said, my life is a lot like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle coming together. Like when I was a uh, mother, I was still married to my first husband, living in the suburbs, going a little crazy. Um, I was very interested in mystery cults, so-called mystery cults, the old religions. And I realized that, you know, there were female deities. Hello? Um, and uh, so when I started to uh, really look at our past, uh, well, that experience made me really go back into prehistory, okay? Uh, in fact, I, I have to say that uh, in, in Cuba, my favorite class, the only one I still remember, was on the old Stone Age. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was something that I was just attracted to trying to, I mean, I didn't know why, but it, 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 it so there were many pieces, as I said, that came together for me. And um, so when I embarked on this study, I drew from a very different, much larger holistic database, mm -hmm. one that unlike conventional studies and conventional categories like right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, uh, Northern, Southern, et cetera, a capitalist socialist, don't marginalize or just ignore the majority of humanity, women and children. And the fact that I, you just cannot look at prehistory without seeing the obvious, except archeologists did for a long time, by the way, <laughs> ignore the obvious, um, which is the prevalence of goddess, of female figurines, of priestess figurines, going all the way back to the Neolithic, uh, the, the, the wall paintings. I mean, my goodness, you know, the so-called Venus figurines, of the old stone age uh, that archeologists called Venus figurines as if, and, and sort of speculated that this was some strange form of ancient pornography. But if you look at them, it is so clear that they're symbolic. First mm -hmm. of all, they're faceless. It's the body of woman with a clearly etched vulva mm -hmm. and uh, they're, <laughs> They're, they're pregnant very often. And the vulvas that archaeologists called indeterminate, uh, indeterminate objects. They couldn't even imagine that this was a vulva, that the reproductive part of woman's body would be part of the sacred art of the period. I mean, 
So there were so many clues. But, um, I mean, <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. But I also was a very curious child. And, you know, my parents um, in Cuba, although they at first really barely managed to survive, once they got, the first thing my mother did, because she was able to take out her jewelries, you know, she would carry those, was to sell them, most of them, and put me in the best schools. Mm-hmm. And the best school near us happened to be a Methodist school. And every day they had chapel and they asked every child, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Well, I'm Jewish. But, you know, after a while, being the only kid that didn't raise her hand became an old thing. So I would raise my hand. And of course, my parents panicked and they hired a rabbi to teach me as if they had to teach me that I'm Jewish. I almost was killed because of the story that Jews are terrible people. And, you know, we hear that story still, uh, of course. Um, so I wanted to know why a woman would ask advice from a snake. Because we usually don't do that. And uh, then I also wanted to know uh, what was it like before the henceforth? You know, it says that henceforth, woman would be subordinate to man. And <laughs> finally, my research answered those questions. And um, Chalice did answer them. You know, the snake was a symbol of the goddess. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, it was a symbol not only of the return of life, you know, it sheds and regrows its skin, but of oracular prophecy. And we even see that in as late as Greek times, after the shift to the domination system, uh, the, some of this survived. The Oracle of Delphi was a Pythoness. A, she worked with Pythons, with snakes, and put herself in an oracular trance to predict. And if you look at the Minoan art, you see these goddess figurines with snakes curled in, in a trance. They're obviously in a trance. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and the snakes are coiled around their arms. So that part of the story made sense in terms of the old reality. The other, the new part of the story that you shouldn't think for yourself, that you may not even think for yourself. Uh, that was the new reality. And it also answered the question of henceforth. Uh, and the, but, idea, uh, the idea of how you treat something and demonize it that actually represents power in a different way from what you're trying to teach. Well, you know, it is really, um, the clues have always been there. I mean, for example, archaeologists, after, after you know, they, they gave up calling them uh, pornography, they decided these are dolls, you know, the Paleolithic goddess figurines. And of course, it makes absolutely no sense if you think of the Venus of La Salle, for example. Mm-hmm. She can't be a doll. She is carved on the mouth of a cave. Mm-hmm. And she has a crescent moon with 13 markings in one hand, which are both the lunar cycles and the cycles of women's menstrual cycles. And she has a very clearly etched vulva and her other hand is pointing to it. Now we don't know exactly what the rites were that were celebrated in that ancient cave sanctuary, but clearly they had a lot to do with woman's life-giving power. from From the research as you were doing it, what were, when you talk about the aha moments, how are you looking at your world? Like, how did your worldview change in that moment to... to well, speak? I think that we have, I mean, what I realized, of course, mm-hmm. uh, and I have two chapters in The Chalice and the Blade, uh, on reality stood on its head. Mm-hmm. Because the change didn't only come through violence, through armed um, invasions, uh, Uh, And we know today, by the way, from archaeology, that warfare, contrary to the story that we're told, is at most five to 10,000 years old. Uh, And it did come in with the domination system. Uh, And yes, the status of women and of caregiving and of giving life played a major part in 
that old reality. But then came the remissing. That's why I have two chapters called Reality Stood on Its Head. And our job today is to stand reality right side up. I mean, consider that in the Bible, there is a passage tucked in um, saying that when a woman gives birth, which in Chatal Huyag, we see a figure of a, pre of a woman, probably a goddess because she's seated, sit, seated on a throne with two um, feline uh lions probably uh, on, on the thing, you know, symbolizing power, um, giving birth, giving birth, which we don't have. I mean, the idea of having a sacred art that celebrates the giving of birth, that was mind-blowing for me. Uh, and so I think it's important that we know that it is possible, possible to have a different kind of society in which, yes, uh, the, the chalice and the blade are two symbols of power, the power of the chalice to give life, to nurture life, to illuminate life, mm -hmm. uh, was a central symbol of power. And, and we're trying to move in that direction, but without <coughs> a new story and new language, new language. It's very difficult. Yes. And when you, when you, you talked about reality stood on its head, um, what were you learning about how we could start to turn reality on its head? Well, we are beginning to. I mean, think of, of what I just said about giving birth. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was young, uh, a pregnant woman could not in the United States teach school in most places, lest children see this obscene sight of obscene, obscene, giving life, right? I mean, they could see violence. That was not obscene. I mean, all of these. And the art shifted, by the way. I mean, I know I'm being very nonlinear here, mm -hmm. but one of, if, if, if uh, I, I, I teach a course online, through the Center for Partnership Systems called Changing Our Story, Changing Our Lives. And there are four videos. And the second video is How Did We Get Here? And if you look at the art, if you see the images, and you see how it suddenly shifted to art that was not there before, idealizing not only violence and weapons and killing, uh, but also somehow power now is, is bigger. You know, the Zeus is huge and the rulers, men all by now, sit on elevated thrones. Whereas in the so-called procession fresco of Minoan Crete, it's a priestess on the same level, holding her arms in benediction like, like the Pope does to this day. Uh, it's a different way. It's what I call a hierarchy of actualization, mm. empowering rather than disempowering. And we need to understand that that is possible. Mm. And I see that Mary wants to know if I was influenced in my research by my uh, Gimbutas. And yes, and you will see that uh, she, but it wasn't only Maria, it was the archaeologist who excavated Chatal Huyak. It was Rafael Patay uh, who wrote about how even in biblical times, uh, if you look at the excavations rather than just reading the Bible, which was rewritten, by the way, lots of times, um, we know from the Dartmouth Bible, from scholars who have analyzed it, but that they still venerated a female deity. Uh, I mean, uh, but yes, Maria, uh, and I subscribe very much to her theory that the shift came through uh, armed incursions, at least in Europe. Um, and it certainly also seems to have been the case in India, um, where in Mahanjadaro and other places, you had, again, cultures where you find a lot of female figurines and uh, no signs of war. I mean, it's, 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 it, once you have the lens of the partnership domination scale and realize that gender is not just a women's issue and that moms 
were once venerated, venerated, and that caring for people was once the goal. That's why you have so many clues of deities, who, who, female deities, even in historic times, like Isis, like uh, uh, Nat, associated with justice, with caring. Mm -hmm. um, then, then you understand that gender is a key social issue and that the movement today to blur the gender stereotypes, which is very, very important. And I don't only mean that, you know, there are lots of people in between <laughs> women and men, uh, but that really men are challenging the equation of, quote, real masculinity with domination and conquest. And also understanding that all the ugly isms, whether it's racism or anti-Semitism uh, in the Middle East, Shia versus Sunni or Sunni versus Shia, that they're connected to that model of humanity of male superior, female, you know, the two forms of humanity, difference in these forms being equated with either superiority or inferiority, dominating or being dominated, being served or serving, that that's a template for in-group versus out-group thinking, beginning with the in-group of, quote, mankind and the female other. And as you were doing this research, you saw, as you stated, you saw that partnership systems were something in prehistory. I don't think we've gone completely into the Minoan cultures besides the figurines, but what was it that you learned about that particular time, about the way that men and women interacted with each other and the planet? Well, one of the most scholars have long raved about Minoan art as being unique, quote unquote, in the annals of civilization. But they don't say why. <laughs> and for one thing, uh, these, the art celebrates nature. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, the so-called dolphin fresco in the so-called queen's apartment in the Palace of Knossos could be a modern ecology poster of dolphins. Mm -hmm. But also the art is full of these really self-possessed, powerful female figures. Uh, I just mentioned one of them, you know, the high priestess or queen or whatever she was. But men were not subordinate. See, this is our language only gives us two possibilities, matriarchy or patriarchy. So it's two sides of a domination coin, either men, father's rule or mother's rule. There is no language. That's why I had to coin language. And that's why we need to use different language because we can't see these configurations of the domination system and the partnership system through the old lenses. A friend of mine, a colleague of mine calls our old social categories, right, left, religious, socialist, etc., weapons of mass distraction because they fragment our consciousness. And of course, there have been oppressive, repressive, violent regimes in every one of these categories. So none of them tell us what we have to build. The partnership configuration does tell us what we have to build. And yes, gender balance, gender equity, caring for children, caring for our natural environment. These are things we're trying to move toward, but in bits and pieces, but they are integral to what I call the partnership configuration. And I know that there's four cornerstones that really emerged for you in this research that um, went on to further look at economic models and how we can take this knowledge that you found in this prehistory time and apply it to the, you know, apply it to now. Well, uh, I, I think that, you know, my first two books really, even though Chalice ends with two scenarios and it does go into modern history, um, but it was really trying to understand how in the heck did we get to this mess? Yes. And then I, I wrote my second book is called Sacred Pleasure, which is sort of a form of heresy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> when was that released? 
that came out in 1995. Amazing. And uh, it is really one of my favorite books. It, it, it applies the templates of the partnership and domination configurations to the remissing of sexuality and spirituality. And the two, the old religion saw sex as not obscene, but as central to the miracle of the rebirth of nature. And I think they had, I mean, their belief system saw the world as a great mother from whose womb all of life ensues, including human and natural life, to whose womb all of life returns at death once again to be reborn. Whether they really believed this literally or whether it was spiritually, we, we don't know. But the symbolism is very, very clear. So um, so what did you ask me? I'm sorry. I, um, I, I knew that four, four things, oh, the four, four cornerstones that emerged from the research. Well, I started to say, then I wrote a book on economics, as you know, the real wealth of nations proposing uh, that was in 2007. Well, in between, I wrote two other books, one on education, Tomorrow's Children, and one which is really like a self-help book, The Power of Partnership. Mm -hmm. And those that book really prefigures, as does Chalice, a lot of what came later in the uh, book. But I started to think more and more, well, what do we have to do mm -hmm. to not go back to any good old days, but to use our knowledge of why, what was the configuration of these more peaceful, more equitable, uh, more pleasure-oriented societies, rather than being held together by pain or the fear of pain, you know, which is what domination systems ultimately are held together by. If you, I mean, violence, abuse, is built into the system. I mean, if you look at Trump, he embodies the configuration of the domination system. You know, he's authoritarian and he believed in being authoritarian in both the family and the state. The family, the family, which is left out of the conventional categories. So um, important. And, and then, of course, male dominance, you know, women are just there. Men are entitled to their bodies, to their work. And Abuse and violence, my God, I mean, the man incited to violence. He was abusive. I mean, <laughs> he really, but he, he only, see, people who are socialized, as he was, mm -hmm. to believe that, they're, that the domination system is the only possibility. He said it. He said it's all about domination. Uh, you either dominate or you're dominated. And if you're dominated, you're weak, you're feminine. I mean, it's a mess. I, and I think on top of it, most people really only believe that's whatever, what has ever existed. Um, well, this is where the chalice and the blade has the evidence. Mm -hmm. And where sacred pleasure has the evidence. And if you do buy chalice, buy either the 56th or 57th. Don't buy a used copy because if you buy a new copy and the Kindle copy, you get the new epilogue, which I wrote for the 30th anniversary of the book. And it really brings it up to date, up to the Trump years. But you asked me about the four cornerstones. Yes. And I keep going off. <laughs> it's okay. uh, well, the four cornerstones, uh, which are laid out in Nurturing Our Humanity, but which really runs through all my books, mm -hmm. are first of all, childhood. And my latest book, Nurturing Our Humanity, which came out with Oxford University Press in 2019, uh, the subtitle is How Domination and Partnership Shape Our Brains, Lives, and Future. And that is full, that book is full of evidence from neuroscience showing how nothing less than our brains develop differently in interaction with our environment and is very, very different depending on the degree of orientation of our culture or subculture to either end of the partnership domination scale. And we've got to understand that because the, nothing less than the architecture of our brains and with it, how we think, how we feel, 
how we act, and yes, including how we vote. So uh, there are studies, and I, they should receive much more publicity, showing that people who voted for Trump, they had two things in common, I mean, generally speaking. One, rigid gender stereotypes and a horror of, yeah, well, grab them by the pussy, right? That's what he said. Um, that's, I, I see it in the, yeah, that's exactly right. A horror of so-called uppity women, you know, women who are, women who are beginning to say, hey, we're human and we are living in a system that was, has to be changed because it doesn't take into account the needs of not only women and moms and children, but men and, and, and our planet. Anyone. Anyone. <laughs> Anyone. Um, so, uh, so first of all, childhood is one of the cornerstones. We have to shift that cornerstone from domination to partnership because we know that whether it was in, well, I'll get to the second cornerstone and then make that point, gender. We've got to get, teach friends, teach colleagues, teach policymakers to think of gender not as just a women's issue or just a gender's issue, but as a key social and economic issue. Mm -hmm. And that is essential because it is, we have a hidden system of gendered values. Not only do we have this model of our species for in-group versus out-group thinking, for scapegoating, which we see writ large today in the world, uh, but also uh, for devaluing anything stereotypically in domination systems considered feminine, like caring for people starting at birth, and caring for nature. And that's why in the Real Wealth of Nations in 2007, I introduced a new economics that goes beyond capitalism and socialism. I mean, we need both. We need businesses and we need uh, government policies, but what kinds? Mm -hmm. What are the rules? What are the rewards? And I introduced the concept of a caring economics of partnerism. And I also introduced the concept of human infrastructure, which I was really happy to see that uh, President Biden and Vice President Pam Kamala Harris are now using. So gender is one of the cornerstones and the people pushing us back get this. It is a central priority, whether it was of the regression of Nazism or the regression of socialism under uh, under on on Stalin and, and et, et cetera, uh, and under Putin still. I mean, do you know what Putin did? Uh, it's in the um, epilogue to, to Chalice, the new epilogue. He reduced the penalty for domestic violence, even though thousands of women are killed in families by their, quote, intimate partners. I mean, they get it, they get it, they understand it, and we've got to change. I, I have pr proposed, and it's on our website, Center for Partnership Studies, still, we still have at this point that, but it will uh, change in a few weeks to Center for Partnership Systems, And but the website is centerforpartnership.org, and look for the progressive and the regressive political agenda and spread that agenda. Uh, we have the power to do that. Uh, and, and that will change the fourth cornerstone economics. And, you know, I've talked quite a bit about that in my keynote yesterday. And of course, story language. We need new stories because we've been told false stories and we need new language. Linguistic psychologists have long told us that the categories, you know, think matriarchy, patriarchy right there, mm -hmm. that a language provides do nothing less than channel our thinking so it's almost impossible to visualize an alternative. And really our old co social categories just fragment our consciousness completely. Yes. So this is, I mean, 
this is really looking at a shift in consciousness. Yes. I feel like for, um, I mean, even just understanding that the goddesses aren't just a myth, I think is a big aha for a lot of people. Um, because from your work, we see they were completely written out and yes. taken away and made invisible because of the values that they held. And it feels like those values actually would get in the way of a domination society and needed to be put away. And I feel like in reading The Chalice and the Blade and, and the reason why I was just about to talk about um, how Chalice was first received. I know we talked about this a little bit in 1987, but I know that there was, um, there was uh, an event that happened in China around the chalice and the blaze. Well, no, it was in on the island of Crete. The island of Crete. But we did we did a study um, in time for the 1995 Women's Conference in China called Women, Men, and the Quality of Life. Mm -hmm. And you can get it again at centerforpartnership.org showing that the status, statistically, using statistical data from 89 nations, showing that the status of women is a powerful predictor of everyone's quality of life and also economic success. Mm -hmm. and, and subsequent studies have verified this. But again, whether even though there are mainstream studies like the World Economic Forum's gender gap reports or the World Happiness reports or the nations that have moved more to the partnership side, like Finland, mm -hmm. for four years in a row now, it has been number one in the world happiness report. It is also very high in, 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 in having less corruption, in being very, you know, they are very successful in business precisely because they invest in our human infrastructure and our natural infrastructure and and our social wealth economic indicators um, that we we launched uh, it, it's a new metric that shows the economic value of the yes largely invisible in both socialism and capitalism which is taught only as reproductive work you know the work done in households or in the market for poverty wages of caregiving mm -hmm. shows the economic value of that ignored and devalued work. And I, we, we now have a team of wonderful economists who are updating these indicators and condensing them into an index. Why? Because we originally launched 24 indicators, and that's a lot of indicators. Mm -hmm. But we'll have one or two, and it'll finally give policymakers the missing data supporting, supporting investment in moms, investment in caring for children, investment in caring for people's health, in caring for, I mean, it, it's a whole different world. And I want to say that this is not only a question of what's right and what's moral and what's good for people, for goodness sakes, for everyone, but of economic success in our post-industrial age when economists who are way off still in la-la land, really, because of, of this distinction, for one thing, between productive, so-called, so-called, and reproductive work, uh, they tell us that the most important capital today is what they call high-quality human capital. What they don't tell us is what we know from neuroscience, that whether or not we do or do not have this high-quality human capital of resilient, uh, creative, adaptive people who can work in teams rather than just taking orders, uh, who can really uh, uh, adjust to change because we live in a rapidly changing age that it largely hinges on one thing, the quality of care and education children receive early on 
in their first years, as we today know from neuroscience. So this is in the, these indicators are different from other so-called GDP alternatives, and I invite all of you to support this work because we not only need to change thinking and consciousness, but we need to invent, well, we need economic inventions like the Social Wealth Index to change things. And, and we can do it. We, we're so creative, but we need to know it's possible. Well, well I think what you're is that this is all human made. 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 So we can figure out how we can build a new future. And that we only have a few more minutes, but I wanted to talk about, you just got off an interview with Spain. Um, and the newest, there's a new version of Chalice and the Blade being released in Spain right now. And you have been speaking to media outlets, the major press, nonstop. We've had so many articles written about this. There's a whole new generation of readers who are learning this information for the first time. And why do you think that this is happening right now and resonating with people right now? Well, I, I've, uh, I've been called a, a practical visionary, mm -hmm. and that means that I've been ahead of my time. Yes. But the times are catching up, and that's so wonderful. And I think what's happening in Spain, and it's not, it's not a, a different version, by the way. It mm -hmm. is an exact translation of the 56th, you know, because it has the new, new epilogue mm -hmm. in it, of the original chalice. You know, my books are, they, they, they're relevant forever, it seems. I was going to say they're timeless. Yes, they're timeless. And I'm very happy about that. But what's really been very much uh, heartening to me is not only being interviewed by the, all of these younger women uh, who are all over this book, but by young men who say, Reading this book gave me hope. Mm. It gave me hope. And I see that somebody wanted to know, what is it, Mary? Mary, you are something. Mm. Um, would the, app, the adoption of the ERA be helpful to bring about? Absolutely, it will be helpful. Listen, I predicted in the Equal Rights Handbook that if the ERA was defeated, we would see a massive political regression. And that is exactly what happened because the rightist fundamentalist corporate alliance that defeated the Equal Rights Amendment, I mean, all it said was that no, the federal government or the state may not discriminate on the basis of sex. I mean, how inno innocuous can you get? Really, it's such a basic principle. Uh, we need to be in the Constitution. The Constitution was formed when women didn't even have the right to vote. Heck, when, when Marx wrote, women couldn't even sue for injuries in most cases, inflicted on them negligently. Only their husbands could for loss of their services. I mean, we need to know our history. We need to change our academy for one thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we know from neuroscience today, what we know from archaeology today, this new story needs to be taught, not just in an occasional course here and there, but in sociology courses, in political science, in economics courses. Uh, and that's what I'm counting on you to do. Yes, I, I feel like I wish it was taught to me in high school history. I feel like reading all these stories about just men over and over again and the things that they created and not feeling like there was any connection to the creation of women for most of my life and reading this book in my 30s and having it change my life um i just want to thank you so much as the young people in spain are saying and i love that the men are saying that this is bringing hope i know that it, it definitely has brought hope to people all over the world for the fact that the history that they believed is true is not and there is something else to look to and you finish the book by talking about having uh, two futures um, and 
I wanted you to very briefly end on what are the two futures, the story of two futures, and how can we get to the future that's built from partnership? Well, one chapter, uh, one of the closing chapters is called Breakdown of Evolution. And we all know that scenario because the struggle for our future is not between right and left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern, capitalist, socialist. It's between those pushing us back to the domination system and those trying to move us forward towards the configuration of the partnership system. So if you do nothing else, mm -hmm. change people's consciousness, help them connect the dots that the Black Lives Matter movement, that's a form of out in-group versus out-group thinking in the United States and in much of the Western world, uh, a form of scapegoating, but so is anti-Semitism, so is being anti-people uh, who are not heterosexual, so is, yes, devaluing women. Uh, I mean, th it's all connected. It's all connected. And, and today we have an intersectionality movement, and that's very important. So... Uh, I, I'm asking you, spread the configuration, spread the history, spread the story, because that's the only way that we've moved from the European Middle Ages, which, you know, with the Inquisition, the Crusades, the witch burnings, uh, women had no rights. Uh, St. Augustine said it. He said, for anyone to even think of questioning their situation in life, it's like a nose wanting to be an eye. Mm -hmm. And we've changed that. Mm -hmm. We can change. And every single progressive movement has changed, has challenged traditions of domination, whether it was the so-called divinely ordained right of kings to rule, or the so-called divinely ordained right of men to rule over women and children, or the so-called divinely ordained right of a, quote, superior race to rule over an inferior race, all the way to our once hallowed domination and conquest of nature, which could do us in, by the way, as a species. Uh, but they haven't paid enough attention to these four cornerstones. And story and language are a good way to begin. Uh, gender just showing that, hey, why do we always have money for the, for prisons, for weapons, for wars, and not for the soft, the so-called feminine? When it's human to care, when we get rewards of pleasure, endorphins, not only when we are cared for, but when we care for another, whether it's a child or a lover or a friend, even a pet. So it has, let's stand reality right side up. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for all of your work, your dedication. The, the fact that you continue to evolve this work and deeply uh, look at what is exactly happening now and how the partnership systems can be applied and moving us into the future. Thank you so much, Rian. Oh, well, thank you, Nyla. And I want to say that it's wonderful working with Nyla uh, as part of our team at the Center for Partnership Systems. Uh, and I'm so glad that we did it this way. This is so much easier, really, uh, to just have a conversation. And I learned, Yeah, uh, I learned so much. It's been such an honor. And thank you, everyone who, Mary, asking all those wonderful questions and everyone who came today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. And thank you, Judith. She just wrote that tomorrow's children and uh, TB, I wonder what TB is, really changed my life. And, and, and that's the feedback I get from people who read these books, that it changes lives, it empowers. You can't, when you have a shift in consciousness, it is very difficult to go back to the way you were. So thank oh. you for making that happen. Is there more happening? Yes, thank you, the State of Woman, for hosting this. And thank you all for coming. Thank you all. And it was the chalice and the blade. That's what she meant. By, it was CB, not TB. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much. And thank you, Nyla, so much. And thank you, Anu, 
for organizing and all of you who have organized this conference. It's been wonderful uh, to know that we are moving forward. We are moving forward. Thank you, everyone. And goodbye.